Thank you very much. Uh, so we have now uh, Rebecca Brown from uh, University of Texas uh, Medical Branch. Uh, she will talk about the, the MCAS in English, Mexican Health and Age Survey. Uh, so you have 30 minutes to question to Rebecca, and then after you come up with the I will introduce Thank you. Also, the National Institute of Geriatrics. 
the University of Wisconsin and the National Institute of Public Health in Mexico. So how we started to think that we would have a representative national um, sample of rural and, rural and urban areas of people 50 years and older, and that we would measure aspects of health, economic aspects, social, and psychosocial, and that we would follow it until death. That is, that's when we exit the study. And at the end of the study, then we ask um, a relative on their death, and in particular, the last year of life. So as you can imagine, because of the multi multiple aspect that you have to think about when you think about an older adult, we think of it about um, a life cycle perspective, how their childhood was, their youth, their young adulthood, and now their current old age. So we have socioeconomic characteristics, their background, health, even in childhood, multiple dimensions of health, self-reported chronic diseases, um, disability, depression, cognition, uh, their social and family network, their migration experiences, the experiences of their children in migration, the help received and given to their children and their parents, then economic data, income, assets, pensions, not only current pensions, but also future pensions that they expect to receive, work history, current work, uh, dwelling characteristics, and the built environment that they live, the impersonal impressions and opinions about health, the economic uh, status, and the um, power of decision that they have, for example, to go to the doctor or have a surgery, and so on. And as I said, the last year of life, and the widowhood. So we can absorb people who uh, become widow, and then what happens to them once widowhood uh, starts. Um, and some of you um, uh, other aspects, like I said, childhood, who lives with them and their children who don't live with them, we also get data from them because they are very important for their adults' well-being. Um, use of services, health healthcare expenditures, and subjective measures, which have become very interesting. Uh, there's a lot of research interest on subjective measures. Um, satisfaction with the social and family network, the perception of how much support they receive from their family, and also a battery of symptoms because many of them don't necessarily go to the doctor because they present some health symptoms. This is just quickly uh, where the sample, uh, the sample is in Mexico. Inegi selected a sample that is quite um, <laughs> um, dispersed, but then I also I would like, always like to show this map because it shows that in in the follow-up, in the longitudinally, then you can find people everywhere because it doesn't matter if someone moves from Yucatan to Tamaulipas, we, we, we will have field work in Tamaulipas, so we'll just tell them, go find this guy who can move from Yucatan. So in, in retrospect, it was a very wise decision from Inegi to have it so dispersed. There's, a, there's an oversample because we have, uh, uh, as you know, a lot of uh, migrants that go from Mexico and return. So we have a lot of history on the older adults of whether they have been migrants to the U.S. in their lives, whether their children are in, in the U.S. And so we have another sample in the, those states with high migration to the United States. So at the beginning in 2001, we identified 11,000 uh, households with at least one person each 50 and over, and we also uh, select or recruit for the study the spouse, if the spouse resides with them. This was the interest of the couple dynamics and aging and deteriorating in health together. And so in follow-up, we follow everyone, whether the spouse is split or not, we follow the spouse as well. And then at the end, as I said, at the end they die, we interview by relative. There are direct interviews, that is, the subject has to give us the interviews, about 80 minutes in, in a, on average. In some few cases, um, the a proxy can be obtained if the person cannot respond directly, and mostly because of illness, sometimes because of temporary um, migration. I'm going to skip this, but basically what I wanted to follow, uh, show from here is the rate of response. We got. Um, a 92% rate of response in the first wave, 
and then a 93% uh, rate of response and follow-up two years later. So we found either alive or dead about 93% of the subjects, the uh, 15,000 that we started with. And then there's a cost in the study, and it wasn't the intentional, but we did two waves, 2001, 2003, and then the third wave appears in 2012. And that's between investigator groups getting together, funding getting uh, obtained, and so on and so forth, we have a large gap between waves two and three, and then in 2012, as I said, we reestablish the study. We follow the same sample that we had had uh, following wave two, in two or three, but we incorporated a few new aspects. So in Eki, again, because there was there had been a long silence between 2003 and we were going to find it in 2012, implemented something that's called recorrido previo, which is like a preliminary run through the sample to try to find them before the interviewer goes to the uh, to the interview. So they went to every household and tried to find them again. Then you locate what is the new address, if the person had died, where do we found the informant that's going to give them the information uh, about the disease, and so on. If there's a couple of split, then we find the two addresses in this preliminary uh, run through. And this was a very, very successful uh, run through, and that actually uh, provided us with very high response rate. It also jumped from being a paper and pencil um, <laughs> survey in ways one and two to a copy of um, computer assisted uh, by computer interview in 2012. A very complex survey, and it was moved from paper and pencil to computer. Again, once again, PNAP uh, was able to, to do this, and we were very pleased with that. Um, Again, we increased the psychosocial context <coughs> where the feel of aging is moving. Also, a lot of emphasis on use of time. We didn't have that before. And the quality of life, satisfaction with life. All of these topics were coming up by the time we went back to the field. So the feel of aging has moved, as you can imagine. And so we were able to incorporate in the new topics. Then we have round four, wave four, which is going to be, which is right now on the field. I don't know why they're all here. <laughs> uh, but anyway, we are here. Uh, the field work is, is happening right now. It's going to end in December. And so in 2015, we incorporated aspects of personality. Again, the field has moved to think about personality traits that make us able to successfully. And so we're going to try to measure some of those in this round. And also, some, we introduced something about the body shape throughout life. So that we, because it's very hard to ask, were you obese when you were young? How was your body? But we show uh, pictures of body shape, and they tell us about what kind of body shape they had at different ages. Because as you know, we have a lot of emphasis now on obesity and all the related comorbidities uh, with obesity. We also have an emphasis on sleep and the quality of sleep. I'm sure everybody in the room can relate to that. And so there's a, a quality of life again and some more uh, about uh, well-being. So we actually have moved now to think that the survey, once established in 2012, should be followed every three years. The sample should be followed every three years. And then we expect that the next one will be in 2018. And like I said, this is a very complex study that has the core questionnaire, the questionnaire for the person who died, the first, uh, there's some cognitive uh, batteries, and there's some um, for the person that's being done by proxy, and so on. So there are a lot of instruments and many pieces that are moving at the same time as the field work follow up. Uh, new types of interviews emerge as new kinds of subjects uh, become uh, eligible to be part of the study. Spouses emerge, then you incorporate into the study, and that means that a new person survey has to be uh, applied. So I'm going to just um, on this one. I just wanted to say that after the nine-year gap between 2003 and 2012, all the credit goes to Inehi again. They got 88% response rate. 
after nine years of a gap, you found 88% of the sample dead or alive. So with this um, slide, what I wanted to show is then the four rounds that are currently uh, in existence. So as I said, there were two, 15,000 people that were um, recruited for the study in 2001, and then two years later, there's wave two, and we followed these subjects. By that time, 546 had died of our 15,000 subjects. We followed them and continued to call them as the red mine. And then we refreshed the sample, as Lucina was talking about, we refreshed in order to continue to represent the population 50 and over. Those had age, and so now the 50 to 60 group is empty by the time we get to 2012. So we added another approximately 5,900 subjects, 50 to 60 in the round three. So then we refreshed the sample that way. And we follow then from there on that green line as well. The red one we have from here and the green one, the new percent. And that's why I said there are new kinds of instruments that need to be applied. There's a follow-up instrument, there's a new person instrument, and so on. By 2012, we have had uh, 2,700 other deaths. And so in cumulative, we have 3,000, almost 3,300 deaths. And if you think about yourself as a person who wants to study mortality, then you are salivating already. <laughs> because this is 3,300 people that died of the 15,000 that we just talked about. And so this is a very, very rich data set to study mortality. And not only mortality, as you know, traditionally we studied from vital registration in Mexico, but now this is a survey we know from these people from 2001, the initial characteristics, and we're going to know the date of uh, death and so on. And then one other aspect that we wanted to highlight is the subsamples. As a particular treat uh, that you can have, a trait, I'm sorry, that you have for longitudinal studies is that you can develop subsamples for special, special interest. So 2001 had a subsample in which we measured anthropometrically their height, their weight, uh, their ability to stand on one foot, so performance measures, as well as anthropometric measures. It serves several purposes. We don't anticipate measuring, say, national prevalence with a small subsample, but we are able to assess the quality of the self-report. Somebody tells you that they measure um, 1.5 meters, then you measure them and see how good is their self-report compared to their self -report. The same thing with uh, other characteristics like weight and, and their ability to walk and so on that they self-report. But then if you measure them here, uh, standing on one foot, etc., then you're able to evaluate the self-report. So we did that as well in uh, way two. We just follow the same the same subsample and do that and did uh, anthropometrics again. But in way three, then we did something completely different or uh, slightly different, which is we got blood samples in a subsample of about 2,000 subjects of the new of the total of 20 from three. We got a, a sample in which we did, did the anthropometrics, but then we did performance measures again, which we asked them to walk, and then you ask them to uh, measure their strength in their hands with the hand grip, and then you also get a blood sample. And so, of course, you only get blood from a subsample because it's very expensive, but also we wanted to guarantee the quality of handling the blood. And so we did it in four states of the 32 states in Mexico, and that was that subsample. So as the study moves with the field and the interest in the field, wave five, which is the current wave, that as I said, is on the field, has a subsample for about 3,000 people that we're going to do, in which this will be a detailed cognitive evaluation. And this is a very interesting project that we're developing in harmonization with the US, England, and India, in which we're all going to incorporate a subsample like this in our national longitudinal studies. I'm going to skip this, but it just says briefly what we do with this uh, blood when we talk about taking blood um, samples in case there's some blood or medical people in the room. This is what we do in the uh, in 
this was happening. So what is valuable according to us? Just briefly to summarize, there are many, many valuable things. But one of them is that it's national, it's longitudinal, and it covers between 2001 and 2005. So four waves of observations during 14 years. Now, we were able to draw trajectories of um, disease progression and disability progression and mortality already in wave three. We were very uh, eager to see how much more we can do with wave four. As I said, we interview uh, direct the uh, person and also relatives in, of the disease. We have very high rates of follow-up and response. And it's comparable with other studies, similar, similar studies in the world. I'm going to show you next uh, slide that shows those other studies. And one of the emphasis, what we do in, in collaboration with our uh, institutions in Mexico, is that we disseminate the use of the data. And we try to facilitate for the user the use of the data. Anything that we can think about that will facilitate the use of this data, please let us know. That's our job. That was what we see as part of our um, mission with this study. There's a portal with INEHI, and also in uh, the study has its own portal. The INEHI portal points to our portal in Spanish and in English. In this uh, portal, we have a databases, the documentation. We have a search engine that uh, takes a look at publications that we have conducted with the data. There's a users forum in which users can uh, post questions and we try to answer them, or other users can answer them. If they don't, then we do. And then there's then we leave all that so that people can see the questions and the answers. And we have uh, provided access to creative variables and tools to create variables so that people don't have to um, invent the wheel every time they create uh, some of the most important and most used variables. Uh, it's been published. I mean, we need many publications have been uh, created, um, done using the data. Just wanted to point some of that. We, we measure the value of the study and the impact of the study based on the number of publications that we can find by others that are not part of the team. And this is part of the search engine. I wanted to point out that the Journal of Salud Pública de Mexico this year published a special volume on aging and all the articles in the uh, special volume use the three ways of the and Oh, this is the uh, global impact that I was saying. We have similar studies. We belong to a family of similar studies. I think today, later, you're going to hear from David Weir, who's the principal investigator of the Health and Retirement Study. It's the first that emerged as the sister study, and it was us. In 2001, they started since 1992. Um, and then there's Puerto Rico and ELSA, which um, was mentioned earlier today, started in 2002. CHAIR started in 2004. That was also mentioned that covers now 20 countries in Europe. Costa Rica in 2005, for, uh, South Korea, Jap uh, Japan, Indonesia. Not all of the studies are alive, but many are. Um, a lot of being active and still gathering data, and some of them, as we do, have to secure the funding each time we want to study the survey, the, some of the services, the, the panel. So each of these countries are struggling the same as we are. Uh, uh, that's Ireland. China, very important. China is where we started in 2011, India in 2012, and Brazil started just this year. They're still gathering data in 2015. So one of the aspects that's very notable is kind of the lack of blue flags in Latin America. So as I said, is the, the continent that's aging the fastest right now. So we are working together in trying to add and, and uh, increase the number of countries that we have in the family. We meet every two years. We collaborate a lot in, um, in what we do together. I wanted to tell you something about the, uh, the work that we can do, and I'm going to skip to this one. This is uh, body mass on the horizontal axis, the body mass, mass index, and then this is the risk of mortality that we can measure with the survey. And you can see that the risk of dying is highest in low weight in, in people that are low weight. 
that in, in malnourished situation, and then it increases as obesity increases. But in this particular population, the, the highest mortality risk is in the elderly. And you can think of a person who gets the disease and starts losing weight also very quickly. And so this is the relative risk of disability out also with body mass in the, in the horizontal axis. And you can see that as with obesity, as the body mass increases, then the risk of disability uh, goes high, very high. And this is all longitudinal studies looking at the three waves of the study. This one shows the relative risk of a start of, of an onset of uh, disability which is three times greater for those who have no education uh, compared to those who do have education, even after you control for socioeconomic and then the dash line socioeconomic and, um, and health characteristics. So still that there's a heavy gradient, very clear and severe gradient of education of onset of disability. I'm gonna skip that in just so the 20 seconds I have, just to conclude. So we have a, a longitudinal study of older adults. We are think we are very, very su successful in part, like I said, in predatory necking, because the population is not very mobile. There are people that are 50 and older in Mexico with not very heavily functioning credit markets. You live in a house very, very hard and you sell that house and go buy another house. <coughs> so people, even if they move from their house with somebody in the, in the family who be in that house, they will know where you are. So that's one of part of the dynamic of uh, mobility in Mexico. As I said, we give a lot of credit to um, the previous run through that they do for the sample, and they also that they leave a little um, always saying that they're coming back. Um, they also gather, we also gather uh, contact of, uh, data for future, future contact, meaning to move, who would know where to where you would move? Um, and I was going to su just suggest if you're thinking of the signing studies, always prepare for at least two rounds. I know that it's very hard to get funding for ten rounds. That, that's probably what you would like. But always prepare for at least two. Don't go just for one and hope that you will get for a second. Get for at least two or three. I think a study is established with three, but that's just a personal opinion. Um, and then, as I said, you always leave it prepared for future follow-up. Always leave it prepared. Because once you have two, it's very easy or much easier to find the follow-up funding if you did a very good job with two. Um, you want to, and this is one of our pet projects, you want to increase the capacity to analyze the data. In countries like Mexico and the rest of Latin America, with the work we do with the, our collaborators, we know that there's very few people who can analyze longitudinal. So, but we also know that the data drives the interest of the animals. So now in Mexico, we have the data, and so hopefully we can drive more interest in analyzing and learning the techniques for longitudinal data. <coughs> and the one uh, project also for the heads of the health sector and the aging sector in Mexico is that they would like to translate the findings of research to the reefs that policymakers can, can 